Hi everyone. Um, welcome to a um, to the March session of the Arkansas Folk and Traditional Arts uh, web series. We I call it the Arkansas Folk Life web series. Um, Arkansas Folk and Traditional Arts is the state folk arts program. Um, we're housed in special collections at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I actually work uh, remotely on the eastern side of the state in Jonesboro. Um, uh, AFTA has a three-pronged mission to document, present, and sustain traditional arts across the state, and we currently have three mainstay programs. This speaker series, our apprenticeship program, and our community scholars training program. For more info about um, any of the work that we do, you can visit folklife.uark.edu, and we'll put that link in the chat for anyone interested. Um, before I introduce Dr. Phillips, I did want to share just a friendly reminder to keep your microphones muted uh, during this presentation. We'll be, it is recorded and we'll be putting it on YouTube. Um, there's gonna be time for questions after our presentation or you can put them into the chat and uh, we can read them out loud at the end. So, um, Jared Phillips holds a doctorate in American history and is assistant professor of international studies at the University of Arkansas. He and his wife, Lindy, run a small mixed power um, farm with draft horses and tractors uh, on the western edge of the Arkansas Ozarks, where they raise heritage sheep, hogs, and forage. In addition to farming, Jared teaches on rural development, development human rights and food security at the University of Arkansas in the International and Global Studies Program. Among his other projects, um, Jared helped found the Oz Arkansas Tool Library and is the author of Hip Billy's Deep Revolution in the Arkansas Ozarks. So um, Jared, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you to start talking and we'll go from there. Well, okay. Uh, well, thanks to 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 you, Lauren and and Jenny, for for inviting me to come and, and do this this talk with AFTA. AFTA, if y'all don't know AFTA and the work that the Folklorist Program is doing here in Arkansas, this is amazing stuff, and you all need to absolutely support it. Do more than just listen to the talks; like take part in the community scholar training, work to source out you know friends or 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 your fellow community experts to to help populate this in the 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 internship and the in the apprenticeship program it's, it's such an important um, and valuable piece not just of preserving the 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 heritage of our state but also uh, allowing us to move forward into the future um, as well and so I think um, this is incredibly valuable work I'm very I'm very honored to be to be able to take part in it today um, so thank y'all thank y'all very much for that uh, so, uh, Lauren asked me to talk about the book, and then she also asked me to talk about the farm work that my wife and I do, uh, as well. So, um, back in 2019, I, uh, published a book called Hit Billy's Deep Revolution in the Arkansas Ozarks. Um, and it's, uh, it's a book on the back to the land movement here in the state's, um, Upland Hill country. Um, so if you all are familiar with Arkansas, you know, we kind of have two hill countries, right? We have the Ozarks north of the Arkansas River, and then we have the Wachita south of the Arkansas River. And if you're from my granddad's era, it was all the same. Um, and then people with university learning in the 80s and 90s decided that we had to split them because the river was there. And so now they're different, um, you know, but he went, he went to his grave um, firmly concerned, convinced that he was an Ozarker, um, even though he spent, you know, most of his life um, in, in between Boonville and Washburn, except for a brief moment where he got to go to the Pacific Ocean on the, you know, on the, on the government's dime. Um, but uh, the, the hill country in the northern part of the state has long held the imagination of, of, of the United States, right? Um, like Appalachia, like other, other mountain communities, we are seen as one of these bastions of traditional livelihoods, traditional ways of being, all of these different things. And sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's a little bit of both. Um, but for whatever reason, um, those are holds on to this, um, holds on to this mystique. And that's part of what will bring a bunch of um, disaffected members of the counterculture in the 1960s and 70s into this place. Um, also, it helped a lot that our land was cheap compared to other places they were looking at. So they're looking to buy land to, to get out of the, you know, get away from San Francisco or Chicago or wherever in the 60s and 70s. It's a lot cheaper to come to Arkansas than it was to try to stay in California. 
And it was also a lot easier season season wise, as far as growing seasons, the, to try to grow food here in Arkansas than it was to do it in, say, Montana or upstate New York. Uh, and so you see a lot of folks for, for monetary reasons, for uh, seasonality reasons, and also for that mythic like kind of Ozark hillbilly preservationist reason coming into the into the hill country. Um, and so because I, I grew up here, my family has been here for a long time. I grew up hearing stories of these people, the field hippies, the country hippies, just these people from off that moved in from Chicago. And they just they were good, good for nothing. They smoked weed all the time and they ran around naked all the time and and didn't do anything. Well, I'm the same age as all their kids. And, and I grew up with some of those kids and thought, like, well, these are great. These are lovely people. And so I don't understand what the problem here is. They get on well with anybody else. And most of the time you go into the co-op or the hardware store, you couldn't tell a hippie from a hillbilly, you know? Um, and so, you know, I couldn't quite understand why everybody was so up in arms about the, about these country hippies um, or the back to the landers. And so um, I decided to write a book about it. And that's, that's kind of what launched me off into this. And so I, because I, you can ask my wife, I get, sometimes I'll get angry about something and then, launch off into a harebrained scheme and bite off way more than I can chew. And that, that's kind of what happened here, honestly. Um, and so I ended up writing, writing the book. I don't know. What do you, what do you, what all do you want me to talk about with this? I guess, Lauren. Um, well, you know, I, I, I guess when I was looking, I, I read the book a few years ago. Um, and, and so I looked back over it a little bit before, before this. And I guess, First question I would ask is, you know, what, how did you begin making connections with people who were in the back to the land community? What was that, that process? Yeah, um, let me do this. Let me pull up, uh, let me share my screen, if that's all right. Yeah. All right, let me skip through. The, so this is the Ozarks. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about. Um, so there's a bigger Ozark area all the way to Missouri, right over the eastern edge of Oklahoma. Teeny little bit in Kansas. You can't see all that well in the map here. Um, and then that green part down there below I-40, um, that'd be the Wachita's and stuff today. Um, and then this little blue area here from Benton and Washington County all the way out to Randolph and Lawrence. That's This is the area that I worked in, broadly speaking. Um, and so... What I did was uh, initially I just reached out to my neighbors. You know, I was still in graduate school at the time, and um, and where my wife and I were living, we were down uh, close to Wilson Park here in Fayetteville. And if y'all know anything about Fayetteville, you know anything about Wilson Park, you know that there's depending on where you're at in the area, there's some of these old back to the land um, folks that when they whenever they decided to come into town, um, it was before the property values really went crazy, and so they were able to buy you know homes in in these really cool areas in Fayetteville. Um, and so I just literally just like went across the street and asked my neighbors, Hey, can I talk to y'all about this? Like, I got this harebrained idea, you know, I want to, you know, ask you about it. And, you know, for the most part, they were all like, Jared, you got better things to do with your time. Like, we don't need to, we don't need to bring these stories up. Like we came to town for a reason. <laughs> um, and I, one person tell me, you know, I said, Hey, you know, I found out, you know, like I saw this story about, you know, this person I thought was you and they, you know, they said, you're like, well, wait a minute now, like, you now officially know more about my past than my current partner does. <laughs> and so like, it was like, a, well, okay, not all stories need to be told um, to, to impetuous young researchers. Um, but basically, I just that, that that word of mouth chain, which I think is so important in, um, in community work like this. Um, and so here you can see, this is how many stories I collected, I collected 40 stories officially. So either through direct interviews or through sending surveys out. Um, and so in all but the first few were a snowball effect. You know, I did a, a few where I knew directly people well enough that I felt I could ask. And then they said, you know what, hang on, I'm going to get a hold of somebody for you and see if you can talk to them. And then, you know, they, you know, be a week or two go by and then they say, hey, yeah, X person said, go ahead and, you know, get a hold of me you know, they're willing to sit down and talk or will, you know, send them a survey. They can't, they're, they're not able or they don't want to come to Fayetteville or they don't want to meet or whatever, but they'll fill out a survey for you. Um, and so, and through that, you know, I met, you know, in, I met with individuals and we would talk for an hour, you know, or two where I would go and I'd meet with groups and I would have like a four hour conversation, you know, with groups down in Mulberry or out in Sonora or wherever. And, um, and, and just kind of pile up all these different stories over time. And then there's a lot of stories um, that I gathered through um, 
news media, you know, old school like newspaper print, um, either through the stuff that the Back to the Landers created themselves um, or through, you know, the good old fashioned Arkansas Gazette, you know, um, or the Springdale Times, you know, whatever the newspaper was, you know, the Baxter County was it the leader or whatever it was, um, the Marshall Mountain Snowball, you know, all that kind of stuff, like the, the Mountain Wave, you know, that those those papers, they would all have stories, you know, every now and then about something that happened and it factored, you know, you know, had a back to the lander, talked about it. And sometimes I could cross-reference that with somebody I'd talk to, um, or it would give me an idea, hey, do you all know who this person is and how can I find them? And, you know, I could find people that way. Um, Mother Earth News, oddly enough, had had a bunch of stories about the Ozarks in it, um, you know, and so, um, for example, one of the winners of the 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 very first sustainable living competitions that Mother Earth News um, ran was uh, a guy named Dan Taylor, Dan and his wife, who lived out in Parthenon, um, outside of the Buffalo and kind of outside of Murray area um, in Newton County, um, and they were farming with draft animals, they were using oxen um and doing a whole bunch of other stuff um and they had a beautiful farm um and uh and they just all the things all the cool things that they were doing they they won this and they got written up in national news you know so they're like you know, cbs news had a story on them and and stuff and so that's kind of how i went out and you know I, word of mouth and then newspaper work and then back to word of mouth and then and then over the course of that i made you know i i, I became um i i like to think friends with with a few of these folks in particular um, and so, and I would, I would, you know, run my ideas past them also, like, cause in this kind of, when you're doing oral history work, it's, it's not like regular archival work where you just like, this is my idea and it's awesome. Like the people are still here. Their story is not finished yet. Um, and the story of the community is never, never finished. And so, um, I never felt like I had the right to just like decide this is the story. This is what it is. And so I'd go back and sort of like, Hey, what do y'all think about this? And there were three or four people I felt like I could really ask that question of and they would they would shoot me straight sometimes they're pretty honestly like, jared you're you got your head on backwards here boy you know like step back and remember this or remember that you know and and uh and so but that, that was invaluable and i think that's if anybody's doing community work you have to be willing to take your work back to the community it doesn't mean you need to change what you're doing but it does mean you need to be responsive to the community um and to what they what they're sensitive about things that they don't want to have talked about you know and um and uh or or they they're like yeah you can talk about it, but you just need to wait till i'm dead you know it's like the statute of limitations hasn't quite run out on x thing or whatever just like well okay <laughs> you know and so yeah um that yeah that's that's wonderful explanation um so as you gather the the research and and stuff i well i guess you form these relationships. Are you still able to go back to some of these people and ask them for like farming advice or maybe life advice now? Oh yeah. Yeah. And we have, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's some folks. So, uh, well, a few years back, um, just Northwest Arkansas being what it is, um, the, the farm that we used to work on was getting pinched in and we couldn't grow the farm anymore. Cause we, we grow our farm is livestock. And so we need land. We don't do intensive vegetables um and so we need what we need is acreage so we can have grazing and, and hay production and um and and so we were starting to look around and we actually uh, we put out feelers in in this community of people and they were looking for us as well and then and then we found something and, and it worked out but i um, mean then also you know fruit trees in particular that's so guy ames you know if you've read the book um you know or you've ever heard me talk about it guy ames features pretty prominently in this in in the book and and he's you know he's a um he's a force of nature if you know guy um but he he's a uh i mean he's a wizard when it comes to tree crops fruit crops um and uh you know he's internationally respected for it uh you know he came here he came here from texas and you know in the 70s and you know to quote him he didn't know shit you know when he came here about gardening or anything he was a full-out urban kid um but he man he you know he he dove in like all of them did into this life um and he had you know like all of them he had lots of struggles along the way but he ends up coming out of it with a master's degree in, in horticulture and plant science and, you know, ends up working on, um, on, you know, apple breeding and strawberries and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And now he's, he's a, you know, he's a crop um, consultant for the national center for appropriate technology, um, you know, out of their Southeast regional office here in, in Fayetteville. And, uh, and he, and so, and he runs a nursery 
um, and uh, with his son Dagan now, and uh, and you can't, I don't, you you can't find better apple trees and and pear trees in 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 the Ozarks than I think the, what you buy from from Ames Orchard and Nursery. Then that you know, I'm not, they're not paying me to say that. I, that's just my own personal experience with with their stuff. Oh, and 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 actually, horses too. They they talk about they all. It seems like most of the most of the back to land community gets interested in horses or mules or oxen at some point. Um, they don't all stick with it, um, but but and so Guy and I, you know, um, when we first started working with horses, it was in 2016, and um, and Guy and I we talked about it all, you know, because I was I was hot in the middle of the research at that time, and 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 you know, seeing Guy a lot because of a different job I was doing, and uh, and so I was asking him all these different things, and and. Uh, and, you know, he's, and finally he said, you know, I love working with, I loved it working with horses, but man, he said, um, you get kicked enough times and, and, you, and uh, I just was over it. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to do it anymore. And so, but he still, you know, like he still loves it. You know, he loves last time he was at the place and he saw horses. I mean, he, he loves seeing them and, you know, they're, they're, they're magical beings. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Horses are definitely magical. Um, you can go ahead with the next, you know, with the next slide, or I can do another question. Why don't what do I? Oh, okay, yeah. So you would ask me earlier about deep revolution. What I mean by this idea, right? This is academics. We have to have a reason to publish a book, right? And so we usually have to come up with some kind of a cockamamie theory about something that may or may not have any relationship to anything in real life. Um, I like to think that I have some relationship to things in real life with this. I don't know that I do. Um, but this is a picture of the Medicine Wheel Commune. Um, Guy Ames was a part of this commune. Um, uh, this was this was down out also outside of out of outside of Murray. Um, so if you're familiar with Donald Harrington's work, the fictional community of Staymore is sort of located out and around this neck of the woods in Newton County. Um, and Guy um, is, uh, if you look at the picture, one of the guys kneeling there. Um, that there's that puppy dog and the feller in the red hoodie. And then there's a little boy. And then the guy, big old smile and a red beard and the check shirt, that's guy right there in the middle. Um, but uh, so what I what I kind of came up with, um, list, you know, after I listened to all these stories and did all the good historical work, right? I read all the books that people had written about the 60s and, you know, everything from like good historical work of which surprisingly, there's actually not like a ton of really good historical work on the counterculture. There is a lot of... Um, there is a lot of like sort of self-serving uh like or, like self-justifying work on like like the 60s were awesome because i was a kind of like how i think about the 90s i guess like i would love to write a cultural history of the 90s because i love I, like you know i came of age in the 90s and therefore the 90s is amazing right um and we all have these kind of you know iconic moments decades in our lives right um for whatever reason um but uh one of the things that i as i was reading through all this stuff that i kind of realized was that they the, the the standard narrative had been that all these people gave up on the revolution they they had been protesting in the streets to, for some reason right in the war in vietnam they had been protesting alongside you know snick and core and dr king um some of them had even protested in support of the red power movement the american indian movement um, and, you know, gender rights, you know, uh, second wave feminism, all the, the burgeoning environmental movement, all of this stuff. Um, and, and to quote one person, you know, what they got was Nixon. They didn't get any of that stuff. In 68, they didn't get revolution. They got Richard Nixon. And, you know, Nixon is many things, but a revolutionary is not what N Mr. Nixon was. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I began to realize was that they... They didn't give up on the revolution. They just gave up on that method of revolution. They gave up, at least for the time being, what they began to realize or began to argue, at least among themselves, um, was that you had, well, they had to go like another layer or two deeper. They had to, as my wife likes to say, they had to rewind far enough. And they weren't rewinding far enough. Um, they had to get back to the roots of community um, and to the roots of human relationship, um, not just with humanity but with the world that humanity is a part of right because remember this is a generation that's coming of age with like you know um uh silent spring it's coming of age with leopold's land ethic kind of being a part of that environmental consciousness now earth day comes into being in the 70s right so this is a whole new way of thinking really um in the 20th century for for people's relationship with the natural world and so they began to argue that um, that while not everything from the past was correct, 
there are many things about the past that were incredibly useful if you want to rebuild community. Um, and so this, this is where I get this notion of a, of a sort of a deeper revolution, a deep revolution that they wanted to go back and, and begin to rebuild human communities one household at a time, one small you know, garden plot or farm or rural town at a time. Um, and that that's how they began to make this network work out. And, and I actually think this is what makes the Arkansas contingent and probably the Missouri contingent as well of the, of the back to the land movement a little bit different than what we see nationally. So when you look at the nation, we have these, the, these pockets, you know, on the West Coast, pockets on the East Coast and then Appalachia. And Appalachia might be the same as well. Um, as we're similar to what we see here in Ozarks, but Appalachia's its own kind of unique history that has to be reckoned with as well. Um, but because the folks that are coming here um, are asking that question about a long-term evolution of community, um, they're willing to play a long game. And if you look um, at the, you know, some different sociologists have done work on the average time spent on the land by back to landers in the 60s and 70s. It's like a nine months to a year and a half was kind of the national average. Well, I don't know if you saw, you know, if y'all saw this a second ago, but I, I ran the numbers here. 14 and a half years is the average time on the land um, for, for back to landers. Um, and that, that that's pretty, pretty impressive, you know, especially when you think about most of them are showing up 68 to 72, and then they're leaving the land in 82, 84, you know, maybe a little bit later. And the 1970s is kind of a unique decade in 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 uh, the region's history um we do see population growth occurring again in the ozarks but it's also one of the coldest and like just generally grossest decades on record you know like i don't know how who you talk to that was dealing with stuff in the 70s in the, in the ozarks it's it's always cold and always full of mud and like nothing grows well it's just like a rough time period you know um and so these people are coming in they don't know anything um about how to live in a place like this they, they you know they've never dealt with rat snakes before chiggers are just like the, a pestilence from you know like biblical proportions right um and they make it work right uh, and they and they don't just make it work but they actually do begin to build a foundation for some of these revolutionary things that they wanted to see right and so um and so in the way that I kind of think that this is true is that one, I talked to all these different people, but then I read all these like letters that they write to one another in their, their, their equivalent of online message boards. So they have these like newsletters that they send back and forth. Like Lion is probably the biggest one um, here in Arkansas. I was living in the Ozarks newsletter um, and the University of Arkansas here in Fayetteville and then UCA. Um, Wow, maybe UCA doesn't have them. I know so U of A here in Fayetteville, we have a complete run of Lion. And then you, and then we also have a complete run of the Ozarks Access Catalog, and then um, which is like the whole Earth Catalog, but for the Ozarks. Um, and then UCA also has a University of Central Arkansas, Conway also, um, at least used to have a, a full collection as well of it. But, um, and they just, they, they had these like big like manifestos in there. Like, this is what we're doing. This is what this is about. Um, this is how this is going to work. And so they're encouraging each other and they're asking questions and it's questions about everything from like, how do I change the brakes in a truck to how do I deliver a baby at home? You know, it's like, I mean, it's like, you know, everything, everything is there. Right. And so there's like all these different types of advice about how to do like basic homestead farm chores to like human health and like well-being. Um, they are in it for the long haul. And, and so, and as a result of that, we get these cool community organizations like Ozark Natural Foods here in Fayetteville is, you know, the, is the legacy of the, of the back to the land movement. They're, if Josh Youngblood is listening to this, he's going to get mad at me when I say this, but they're far less radical than they used to be. When you, when you, you know, you can look at their old newsletters, which is on paper stolen from the University of Arkansas's dumpsters. So like on one side of it's the accounting for the business school. And on the other side of it are like these like food is, you know, food is freedom. Like, you know, how do we decolonize the food system and empower poor people in the mountains and whatever um, to um, micro lending institutions like Forge um, financing Ozark's rural growth and economy over in Huntsville. That's a part of the back to the landers legacy. Um, and you know, some of the very first standards for organic agriculture are in the United States come out of the Ozarks with the Ozark Organic Growers Association. Um, you know, so they, they they build this foundation that that really does begin to change a lot of different things, not just here, but across the country. Yeah, that's um I that's great. I so so how do you see deep revolution moving forward in the Ozarks today? Like how, how has it continued? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a question I think about a lot, actually, because I don't, I actually think it's harder for it to move along now. Um, and, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Um, but I, and the reason I feel like it's harder now is um, some, some like very real things about how we function as a society have changed than from the 70s and some in really good ways, right? Um, but, but some things like, you know, you could actually kind of make a revolutionary stand by leaving suburbia and like moving to a homestead to grow all your own food in the 70s because food was still such a large part of the average American's household budget. And today it's just not, um, you know, and so um, that, so like you kind of lose some power in that way. Um, the, the nature of land tenure in the Ozarks has radically changed um, in the last 40 years. And so I think that, you know, that makes it a lot harder for these, for, for these ideas of, of kind of a, a, a rural, sort of deeper idea of a revolution to take to take root. And I don't just mean that in terms of like who's farming, like our farming numbers have radically changed, you know, like um, uh, there's been like a 27% drop in the amount of acres farmed in the Ozarks since 1950, um, you know, stuff like this. And in like the average size of the, of the of a farm in, in the Ozarks has jumped by 80% while, you know, the number of farmers that are farming in the Ozarks has dropped by over 50%, right? Um, and so, like, it, it's just harder to make some of these things work because of some of those realities. But also, um, one of the things that's kind of, I think, making a deep revolution in this way, as simple or not as simple as as, as potentially successful as it was in the 70s, is that um, a lot of the Ozarks are being kind of informally enclosed in a way. Um, and so and what I, what I mean by that is that we're seeing, as, as we're seeing massive population growth in a couple of areas um, on, in, in, in key spots in the Ozarks. So Washington, Benton County here in Arkansas, Springfield um, in Missouri, even Harrison a little bit um, down, you know, um, you're, and, you know, like, and then Eureka, maybe even Berryville, you know, as we're starting to see these little, these, what were once sort of sleepy fringe Ozark towns booming, um, the Ozarks are being cast no longer as a place that you come and you live and you work hard and you and you're neighborly, but you come and you re and you recreate here. You come and you you go out and you and you you do certain activities and then you leave, right? But the assumption is that no one is there until you get there and no one is there after you leave, right? This is sort of the modern understanding of outdoor recreation. Um, and and. And when you when we have an economy that's building like that, um, it does a bunch of different things, right? So there's all these different studies that talk about how, well, it looks like poverty lessens in rural economies where recreation becomes a big part. Well, yeah, it does. It, poverty does go down, but that's because poor people can't afford to stay there anymore, so they leave, right? So they go to somewhere else because they they can't afford land or home or they can't find a job or all the jobs now are seasonal, right? Because it doesn't it doesn't make any sense anymore to keep keep the farm going even when it, you know, it barely made sense before. And it really doesn't now if you can make way more money renting campsites out than trying to grow a crop or something. Well, now the jobs are seasonal and seasonal jobs. We've all had seasonal jobs. Seasonal jobs, they're fun for a little bit, but like if you're trying to make a living, have a family with that, like, well, that's hard to do, you know? Um, so I think it's making it difficult. Um, but I would also, I mean, I would also say that like, if you are, interested in trying i think we have tools now that we didn't have then so like living in the ozarks newsletter is a super like it's super cool as a historian for me to look through that and read through that these like fun little time capsules but those are super delayed right um and so if you're a farmer or you're a rural crafts person and you're trying to like sell your goods um and you're and you're relying on you gotta send something in get it published in this newsletter and the newsletter has got to get mailed out and somebody has got to mail back to you or call you. You know, you're talking a long turnaround time on selling your goods. Right. But now we have, you know, through the expansion of rural internet, which is made possible by some of these things that I just was criticizing. Um, we, you have the opportunity to sell your products in a much more timely fashion, generate, you know, potentially have a better or more stable income stream to supplement maybe seasonal work. Yeah, I think that, you know, there are ways that it can probably work together, but um, I, th I think it, there's just new challenges. Maybe I should have just said that there's new challenges. Well, I, I, I mean, not to 
answer my own question, but to absolutely answer my own question a little bit. I I see deep revolution in the Ozarks unfolding in a different way, more through um, you know, nonprofits like like the work that like Meredith Martin Motes does at the oh, yeah. House in Russellville or the work that yeah. Rachel Reynolds is doing at the People's Library and you founded a tool library like those um that that type of community activism in rural communities I, I think is I see it growing in my work and and I think I think that's a spot where we see this new type of of deep long-term revolution yeah that's interesting I'm glad you said I'm glad you brought up Rachel Rachel's work over at Meadow Creek is super interesting you know Meadow Creek is one of these old back to lander establishments that that has been kept alive and Rachel's really brought a bunch of new like life and energy into what's happening out there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and she's, she's another one of these great examples of sort of like what modern folklore and the preservation, but also the healthy evolution of um, what is traditional Ozarks, traditional mountain people kind of looks like needs to maybe think about as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I'll stand corrected on that. That's yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm not trying to correct you. I, th I think we both make a good point. <laughs> what else have you got? Um, okay, so if we're still sticking to the topic of the book and things like mm -hmm. that, um, the next sort of big, bigger loaded question is more about how I think oftentimes the um, image that is portrayed of the Ozarks and um, who Ozarkers are and what it means to be a hillbilly seems very at odds with what the Back to the Land movement is about. And um, I, of course, some of that's true, but there's also a lot of ways that I think the Back the, to the Land movement and old stock Ozarkers, to borrow from Brian Campbell, um, you know, that, that I think there's a lot of ways that they have a lot of things in common. I'm wondering if you could talk about some of those commonalities. Yeah, so the story, you know, is always that they were opposed to one another, right? Here, I'll change the picture. There we go. Um, so if you didn't know what you were looking at, you could think that that's either hippies or hillbillies, right? Um, this is this is a hippie couple walking back to a little, little cabin that they built. Um, uh, and this is taken from the Ozark Access Catalog um, that they that they put together. Um, the story is that the hippies and the hillbillies don't get on very well. And some of them don't get on. You know, some of them, there there are absolutely episodes where Ozarkers, you know, old stock Ozarkers, so kind of traditional, probably at least one generation, you know, one or two generations into the Ozarks, um, were not kind to the newcomers. And, and, um, and you know, they're... I know of a couple of burning outs, you know, that happened. Um, uh, but that's really not the the normal relationship that I that I found when I when I, you know, I kind of like poured through um, newspapers and interviews. And this is always this is a question I asked everybody and almost without I mean, without exception, every single interview I did, everybody was like, yeah, they were a little standoffish at first but when they realized that we weren't going to put LSD in the drinking water and that we were actually interested in learning how to work and like want and wanted to know what they knew so that we could do it too boy that changed everything you know um and so the what I found was is that this the the conflict is not between old stock Ozarkers and here I want to I'm going to, I'm going to give a, I want to, if I can be an academic for a second, let's, I want to make a dis, d distinction between how Brian thinks about this. So, right. Brian kind of uses it as a catch all term for all older generation Ozarkers. I think we could, we could even maybe break it down a little further and say there's, there's rural old stockers and there's urban old stockers. And I just mean urban old stockers be people that live in Berryville or live in Eureka or Harrison or whatever. And then and everybody else is out in the Hills, right? So hill folk versus not hill folk, I guess, if you want. Um, and, in some of the towns, especially towns that have tourism as one of their big tourism and retirement communities as a big income generator for them, they don't necessarily like the back to the land influence. 
um, for a couple of different reasons. It's a little bit different in all the different in the different towns. So like Mountain Home doesn't like it because they're worried. So like Mountain Home doesn't want to have a community college put in because they're worried it's going to bring in um, civil rights problems, right? Because Mountain Home's got a retirement community outside of it. A bunch of people are retiring out of Chicago. This is in the 60s and the 70s in the wake of civil rights movement, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of direct and indirect racism, you know, it's in the pushback against people from off. Um, and you'll see similar kind of concerns in Eureka Springs and Berryville and, and elsewhere. And the thing that's important to remember here is that many of the people, if not, or many of the people that are pushing those concerns are either, as we say up here from off, they're, they're not from the Ozarks, or they're trying to make money off the people from off. Um, and so, you know, bankers, um, real estate developers, Folks that are, you know, that are integral parts of the community have been there for a long time, but they're 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 very interested in a certain way of developing the Ozarks. They they realize that the hippies can they can make them some money, but if the hippies are successful, they won't make them money for long because the hippies are trying to be somewhat self sufficient, right? Um, which is like old stock, you know, the hill folk. Uh, they're somewhat self sufficient, right? And so they need people that are going to be willing to come in and buy stuff all the time, you know. Um, and so that's where that conflict kind of comes in. And so, and I talk about that a little bit in the book, sort of where some of those conflicts are. Um, but the, what really I think binds the back to landers to the old stock together is, um, in the fifties and the sixties, the Ozarks, like so many rural spaces in America experiences a massive out migration of people. Um, and there's, there's a ton of different reasons for it that could fill a whole other hour of conversation. But but as a general rule, we have negative numbers of population growth in almost every Ozark County in, Ar in, in Arkansas for most of the 50s and most of the 60s. That number begins to change into the positive in the late 60s into the early 70s. And it's, um, and it's a combination of retirees coming in um, and then back to the landers. In the back to the landers, they go straight to the rural area and they ask old people about things that old people value. They ask and they they're asking the questions that in many cases these old hill families wish that their children had stayed home to do. Um, they ask about stuff like how do you build fence and how do you haul hay and how do you repair tractors and how, you know how do you do all of these different things and they build the they they one they they build value back into these old skills. Um, that were being that that uh, when you when you look in the 1950s and the 1960s at what's being told to rural America is everything that you know and hold dear is not what's cool anymore, right? This is the decade. These are the decades of affluence, right? This is you know Bel Airs and and, and Elvis are what's popular and cool right now, not you know old home, homespun kind of stuff. We have comic shows on TV that are kind of like preserving a jokey idea of that, but not not for real. You're not really supposed to take you know, Mayberry seriously, right? Um, and so, but these kids do, they take it seriously. They they want to understand like what in Foxfire is true. You know, what what can I take out of a, you know, you know, is this actually how you skin, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, skin a cow? Is this actually how you process a pig? Is this actually how you build a log cabin? Um, and, and if not, how do we do it here? What, what's the right way to do this? You know, um, and, and, and that, I think I talk in the book about it a little bit, um, but they, the back to landers almost begin to serve as a, as a surrogate generation, a replacement generation here in the region. Um, and I think that's actually probably true across the country. Um, you know, I, I can't say that for certain because I, you know, I didn't conduct surveys across the country, but I think, I think you're going to, especially in the Ozarks, I think for sure in Appalachia, and probably everywhere else, the back to the landers are going to be, you know, um, they're going to be seen as as a surrogate, um, as a surrogate generation. And it's not just these farm skills. It's every it's, you know, how do you gather plants in the forest? Like, how do you understand commons spaces like that? Right. How do you how do you do stuff like um, make baskets? You know, how do you how do you, um, you know, some of it's as simple as how do you split wood? You know, like how do you fell a tree safely? How, what what tree should you fell for firewood? And then how do you split it? You know, all these like really simple tasks, but that are 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 they're they're a learned skill, they're a learned craft, they're a learned art. You know, like there there is an art to these things, um, and and they were given, well, they were given dignity again um after decades of not being given dignity and i think that was that was huge for a lot and that was a, that was it what kept coming back in all these different stories was 
was that was that kind of overarching idea yeah that's uh that's really interesting i um yeah i i the that connection i i i want to point out that it well it, it's it's really interesting and wonderful and and i'm so glad that those traditions and the information has been carried forward and that there were people who were privileged enough that they could come to the area and learn those skills it does make me kind of sad that the uh children the of the people who were growing up in this area you know it was rural it didn't we were more impoverished areas and and they had to move and for work and and um sometimes i'm sure that they wish they had had the choice to be able to be here too i guess um, yeah I just yeah. want to speak that out there, um, you know. <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right, um, and 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 I'm glad you used that word privilege as well. Because one thing I didn't talk about was one thing we should understand from the very beginning: if you're a back to the lander, no matter where you are in the country, is you're almost absolutely white, decently well educated, and coming from the middle class. And so you you have if this doesn't work out for you, this is basically summer camp. You can go back and do something else, right? Um, and, uh, and that, I mean, and that happens a lot, even here. Um, um, and so you have to be in a, in a state of social economic and even gender privilege to be able to do this work, um, here. Um, that's not to devalue the work that's done, but you do, you are sitting in a unique situation, I think, um, to do that. Um, and then, yeah, I think, um, you know, what you're just saying, like, you know, when I talk about this stuff, I think a lot about my uncle and my aunt and my dad, you know, like they, you know, they're that generation that would have been back to the landers that they had been from off, you know, that's where they would have would have fallen in generationally. Um, you know, but my granddad, like, you know, like so many other, um, you know, folks of the, of that World War Depression, World War II generation, you know, they remembered, you know, how hard all that life, how hard that work was. And they, they very much wanted to, like, build a world where their kids didn't have to stay on the farm and then so you so you have this pressure yeah you know, that familiar pressure of like we gotta you know you gotta go do something bigger and better right well um so there's this then then the whole rural economy of the country changes in the 50s and the 60s and so the nature of agriculture changes dramatically in the 50s and the 60s it changes slower here um but it's still it's still a sea change you know by the time we get to the end of the 60s working stock are, are not Dis they haven't disappeared from the hill farms here, but they're 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 mostly gone. You know, 1954, like 14,000 farms in the Ozarks were using either only horses and mules or a combination of horses, mules, and tractors, right? And and then by the end of the 60s, early 70s, the USDA is not even asking, do you have work animals on the farm anymore? Right. They just that that's gone. So we just don't need the labor any longer. Um, there's chemical agriculture that's now the wave of the future, right? And so we've, we're we're both putting people out of work and then also needing these new things because we don't have people for the work, right? Because they're leaving. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's it's a it's a historical mess, like in in a lot of ways. And I think it's left real kind of regional sites of like kind of like collective memory trauma when you kind of like move around the country and ask what that looks like in different places. Um, and that's, that, to me, that'd be a really interesting thing for scholars to kind of like begin to unpack a little bit. Like, what is that? You know, it's one thing if a family farm goes out, it's another thing if like all the farms in a place go out and then the town dies, right? Like what happens then? Like, it's, you know, like where, where do those, who cares for the gravestones? You know, like what, what happens at that point? Right. Um, and, and the backlanders don't, you know, they don't, that wasn't their that wasn't what they were coming on to do they weren't coming on to take on an abandoned graveyard right you know and and they and they they'll help out they help out the community but they're not they're not caring for the family plots you, you know and so yeah yeah no that's it it's it's very it's very very complicated and and i like the way that you that you're explaining it um and that, and adding adding different layers so um you just mentioned horses a minute ago, so I'm going to kind of move into the present a little bit more and talk about the work that you're doing um, with your farm right now. So I know that you have a mixed farm, you're using uh, machinery and you're using animals. So mm -hmm. first, just, you know, give us a rundown of what are you producing? What's what's going on? Yeah, so we started. Um... 
our farm and the, the, so we started fooling around with vegetables in like 14, 2014, 2015, decided that neither one of us had the patience for it. If you're, if you, if you're listening in on this and you're a vegetable farmer, you've, you have my utter respect. Um, and uh, I, I can't handle more than a garden. Um, but uh, no, we, we, we got into sheep and then cattle and hogs. We mostly do sheep and hogs. Um, we just, for whatever reason, it works for us until we like it. Uh, and then we, we grow, um, we, we do all our own hay. Um, and then we, um, just this last year, we started growing sorghum cane um, with some friends of ours who, who've been very gracious um, to, to allow us to, to stumble around and, and laugh at us. Not, not just too much, but some. Uh, and then we, we um, when drought doesn't burn it up, we grow corn to feed hogs out. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Um, and and then when we decided to do this, we decided to, we wanted to work with, use horses on the farm as much as possible. Um, for a lot of different reasons, I guess. Um, one, because we want to, um, which is very important. If you're going to do things the hard way, you have you have to know that you want to do it that way. Um, and uh, and then two, um, uh, you know, there's ecological reasons. I think for it, we 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 feel like I don't feel like it's the right decision for every farm. For our farm, in our context, using horsepower makes a lot of environmental sense for us. Um, the impact on the ground is much less. Um, believe it or not, like some things are actually safer with using my horses than, than it is to, if I was in a big old tractor. Um, and then, uh, the, the other thing is, um, we're, you know, I'm a historian. My wife went to school as an anthropologist and then you know, like we both worked in community development. And, and one of the things that we, 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 um, realized early on was that we really, we really want things to like, to do things that, that are, not just things that we want to do, not just things that we take joy and love out of, which we do all with all this, but but that gives something back to the community. Um, and we realized pretty quickly on that that working with draft animals um, gives back in a couple of ways. Um, when it lets us take part in community events so we can put horses in a parade and pray grow over, go turn the sorghum press for Cane Hill or whatever. And so we're there, we're in the community, we can be a part of the community in that way, help out the community in that way. The community has given us so much. It's like the absolute least that we can do back, you know? Um, and then, uh, but the other thing is that we really think that, um, for, for, for agriculture to survive, um, in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is in a way that provides useful ecosystem services, I think that, um, draft animals are a crucial part of that question. Um, and so we would like, we preserve, we consciously preserve some of these technologies and these, and these systems, um, in our place, um, with that in mind. And so that's kind of why, why we use horses. Um, I actually have a, I have a picture of horses. There we go. There's my horses right there. There's our horses there. Um, so the one that you can see closest to us is a mare, um, that's Bell. And then the far one is Ted. So we use Belgian horses, not because Belgians are better than anybody else's, any other breed of horses is what we like. Um, and then, you know, there's all kinds of different draft breeds out there, but, um, but yeah, we, um, and, and, you know, like we, honest to God, the reason why there's people my age that are still working with horses, if you're not in a plain community, you know, an Amish or a Mennonite community, it's probably because of back to the lander hooked up with some, you know, old timer who was skidding logs with mules or plowing a garden with mules and like, kept some harness around, you know, kept it alive. And so, you know, we've connected with, um, you know, every, almost every back to lander I talked to fool with draft animals a little bit. Some of the the longest running draft horse publications in the country were started by sort of back to the landers in the seventies, you know, draft or small farmers journal would be the biggest one. Um, and it, you know, it's filled, filled full of, of, of this kind of stuff. This is sort of like old way of, of asking these questions. So Wendell Berry works with draft horses, right? How big of an influence? I, I mean, I didn't write that question down, but it just popped in my mind. It would, I know you talk about him in the book. Big influence on. Yeah, yeah he's a big influence on us um, for sure. I think if you're farming in the Upland South um, and uh, you have horses and you haven't read Wendell Berry, you're an anomaly or you're in the playing community. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's probably what I would say, but yeah, no, he's a huge influence on us. Um, um, you know, we have, you know, we have friends that work for the, 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 the Berry Center and the Berry Center, the Sterling College Initiative over there and that we ask questions of and, and, and do stuff with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Wendell, um, I mean, the, the legacy of Wendell's writing and thought on, on the back to land community on modern kind of agrarianism 
um, just simply it can't be it can't be understated or or overstated. You can't we can't figure out probably a, a, an appropriate way to talk about it. Um, it's not perfect, you know. You know, there's ways you can criticize it, um, and, uh, and and that's fine and good and should be done. Um, but I think, um, but one of the things that 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 always that, that attracted us to horses and, and initially was his sort of the way he thought about that, and, and and really the way the horses form a community. You know, it's a community of work. When I'm working with the horses, um, you know, it's a it's a community of work. It's not just me and a tractor. You know, I have a tractor for the hay baler, and because you can't beat a hydraulic lift arm, man, um, for picking up heavy stuff. But uh, you uh, you're always in you're always in conversation with a with a with a horse or a pair of horses when you're working, and it's that that community of work and and how they can understand the natural world in a way that you can't. You know, they'll know and when a deer is, you know, when a little fawn is in the grass when I'm cutting hay and I can't see it, even though I'm real low and close and they'll stop and we can get it out of the way or rabbits or birds or whatever. Um, you know, I can't do that on a tractor. I can't, you can't see or hear anything on a tractor. You know, you're moving too fast. It's too loud or you're too high or whatever. Yeah. So is there, um, another, is there like a more local influence that, that made you go the route of, draft horses you know like with someone within the community that really got you started I wish um no when we started we didn't know anybody else in the area that worked horses um you know I I when I was little my granddad had horses um and so I knew about um riding horses just like a little bit my wife when she was growing up and through high school worked with horses riding horses a lot but neither one of us had done anything with draft horses and and I hadn't really done anything with horses in you know it would seem like eternity um and uh no we met uh there's a guy outside of Prairie Grove his name is Lloyd Holly who's a mule skinner um so big he works with mules and, and he does big wagon hitches and stuff he didn't really anymore he doesn't really work much he taught us how to harness horses um and then after that we just relied on um we, we relied on Facebook actually um, which is, I would, if you want to get into draft animals, this is not how you should do this. I'm going to tell you this right now. Um, but so some friends of ours that one, a guy I grew up with here in Arkansas, he and his partner live in um, outside of Seattle and they do a vegetable farm and they work with draft horses. And they're the ones that first were like, you guys should do this. You, like you guys can do this and you should do this. What they neglected to tell us was that out there is a thriving draft horse community. And there's not really one here anymore uh, in the Ozarks in, in, in Arkansas. Um, and, uh, and so we, you know, we just kind of like jumped off, you know, the deep end and held our noses and, and, uh, you know, we've had some mishaps along the way, nothing too serious. Um, thank God. And, uh, but, um, we've been fortunate. We've had really good horses. Um, really good horses are the key, um, to it. So the, our, our first big team of horses, um, they're retired now and just hang out in the pasture and eat hay. Um, they were probably the best teachers that we could have ever asked for, for, and then this pair here that you see, they're our current working team. Um, and, and one of them, actually the one, the, the, the one you can see closest, you know, to the, to the, in the picture, um, we bought from a guy, um, here in, in Washington County, who's had them wearing Pilgrim logging. If you're in the Western side of the Ozarks and need logging work done, call Roy Pilgrim, Pilgrim logging. Um, and, uh, but, uh, he had been logging with horses and then decided to, to switch over to using, you know, mechanical skitters. And so, we bought that mare from her when we needed to repl start replacing our team. And then there, there is a thriving Amish and Mennonite community in Missouri and I'm starting to come down this way here into Arkansas, but no, there's not anybody, not anybody that we've, we found that still is like for like working, you know, a lot with horses anymore. Uh, it sounds like you, you followed the back to the lander tradition of just kind of jumping in blonde yeah. and figuring it out as you go, which is, it's yeah its own you know it has its own ups um so what does like um let's see what does it mean to um have a farm that where your where your main uh the your main product is sheep and hogs like, where you're mainly mainly working with animals like what does that work look like on a daily basis yeah it comes and goes um you know, in the, in the winter and fall or, or like, yeah, the winter and fall is, I mean, we're, well, here, so right now we're getting ready, our, our count, our farming year kind of begins right about now. We're getting ready to start dropping lambs um, here in the next week or two. And that's kind of the beginning of our, of our year, I guess you could say. Um, 
And so we will start dropping lambs. And so that just means that we are, the, the ewes will start giving birth and we'll be working to make sure that everybody's alive and healthy and good, you know. Um, we'll still be feeding hay out this time of year, even though it's been warmer than normal, there's still not a ton of grass growing just yet. So we're feeding hay out um, most every day. Um, we do a lot of rotational grazing. And so we don't, um, you know, we're able to stockpile grass um, and then so that we don't always have to feed as much hay, um, which that's a whole other, you know, con like a conversation. But then um, by the time we get into May-ish, you know, April, end of April, early May, all the lambs are born. Um, and then we start, um, we start, you know, we're, we're doing our garden stuff on the, you know, as we can on the side, turn the garden over, but then we'll, we'll have the, the, the corn and the sorghum patch will be plowed up and, um, planted by middle end of May. And then I'm, and I'm cutting hay by then, you know, like, like most farms in the Ozarks, you know, May through August, September is dominated by the hay cutting schedule, you know? Um, and so we cut hay, um, and I just do it a lot slower than my neighbors do. You know, I cut, you know, a couple acres a day you know, um, you know, where they cut 50, 60, 80, hundred a day, you know, but, um, but that's okay. Cause you know, we do, we do small square bales. Um, and we, we bail up just exactly what we need for a year. I don't, we don't sell any hay or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and then that, that kind of dominates the summer work. Um, and then in the, by the time we get into falls, when we get, we start reconditioning the use. So, you know, we've weaned off the lambs, we're making sure they use body condition. So getting their, their, their fat levels kind of back, you know, on a rising plane of nutrition, getting them good and healthy before we turn the ram back in with them to rebreed for the next year. Um, the, the other things that are going on in our, in kind of our farming year, we, we raise hogs out, we raise sets of eight hogs out on a cycle every, you know, seven to nine months, we, we'll bring in a set of hogs and finish a set of hogs out. Um, and so we put those, we, we, we kind of do a, a sort of an old school thing. We, most of those archers traditionally would just sort of turn hogs out into the timber. And then when it was, they felt like it was time to kill them and go out and find, find hogs in the timber and bring them back through. And, um, and if you're lucky, you got your hogs. Um, and so, um, but we, we use electric line out in, in, in our, some of our timberland and to make sure our hogs don't go wandering off. Um, and so we forest, you know, the fancy term is we forest our, 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 our pigs. Um, and so we have a, a cycle where we're, you know, we're always moving, always moving pork along. And then, um, you know, in May, April, May, we shear our sheep. And when I say we, I should be very clear here. My wife does the shearing. She runs a shearing company. Um, and she travels kind of all around, you know, like Southern Missouri, South, Southwestern Missouri, Arkansas, like West, Eastern Oklahoma, um, and, and does she, you know, shears wool sheep. Um, and so we shear off the wool uh, or she shears off the wool um, for our flock and for, you know, a bunch of other folks, uh, in the area as well. And that keeps her busy, you know, just like I'm busy running hay stuff. She's busy running wool stuff, you know, through June, you know, early July. And that, I mean, that's really kind of, you know, it's kind of the, it's kind of the year. It's not, it's not as like, you know, we have high periods of, you know, we have short, short intense periods, you know, we're putting up hay or dealing with lambs or whatever. Um, but we, it, it's usually punctuated by like nice periods of slowdown, you know, so we can go play at the river, go down to the creek. We live above the Muddy Fork. And so I can, we just walk down the hill to the Muddy Fork or the White River and, um, and go play, you know, and do whatever. But um, we're vegetable folks. They kind of, you know, from what I understand, they're pretty much January starts and they're, they're hitting it till, you know, first frost in October. And so just like, man, that's, that's, that's a heavy, that's a heavy load. It is, it is. Vegetable farming is a heavy load. Um, so what, a question that came to mind when you were talking about the shearing process is what happens to the wool? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. All right, so this is, um, that's what cutting hay looks like with horses. You look at horse butts all day um, and uh, old mower. Um, so here's our sheep and hogs. And then um, that's that horse bell again, spinning a sorghum press. Um, and so let's see here. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, so yeah, our products on the farm are meat and wool. I and mean, that's what we have. So my wife, Lindy, uh, and her business partner, uh, Abby Hollis have started an Ozark branch of the national fiber shed movement. So fiber sheds, a national branch or a national organization started out of California. Um, and, um, it has regional affiliates everywhere. And so Lindy and Abby last year started the Ozark fiber shed. Um, and, um, traditionally, um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, there was, sort of a wool market in the country and so sheep producers wool producers could sell their wool into the wool market um and, and american wool is traditionally a coarse wool or a medium wool and so it'd be turned into like 
like outer garments, not next to skin, skin garments or like rugs, stuff like that. Um, but when when Congress changed how it wanted to do price support programming in the 90s, um, the price supports for wool kind of went away. And, and then with that went the wool market. So the American wool market's pretty pretty much in the dump, in the in the tank right now. Um, and so what what wool producers had to do is get real real careful and real crafty about how they deal with stuff. And so what groups like the fiber shed are trying to do um, are to ask questions about, well, how do we one understand what we have, you know, what what is still left of this old economy? Um, everything from mills to fiber artists to producers to folks that are just trying to get just they, they just raise wool sheep and they just need to get rid of all this wool that they have in their barn. Um, and then uh, and figure out ways to create. Um, new revenue streams for all of those members, all the, all those members of that system, right? So it's like thinking about a food shed, you know, for a long time, we talked about the food system and how do we improve the local food system? And this is the same idea for fiber. And so around, you know, they, Lindy and Abby focus on, on wool right now, but other fiber sheds look at other things as well, you know, and so there's, there's all kinds of ways you can look at, but the idea is that we would be able to create, cre rebuild an economy here that will support at least partially the um the wool industry here wow that's that's really inspiring um so are your kids also involved in uh any of the farming oh yeah yeah um you know uh hay season my oldest boy you know he drives the, the hay truck um you know when we're picking up hay's in the, in the field and he helps unload everything um, you know, they all take part in, you know, the daily care of the animals. Um, you know, they, they, they're learning to work the horses, um, you know, and they, they learn all the, the maintenance, you know, on all the equipment and how we, you know, because we run horse drawn stuff, a lot of it's, you know, almost a century old. So it needs a lot of really weird maintenance to keep it running. And so they, you know, they learn all that, you know, with me when I pull a machine in the shop, somebody's usually out there with me. Sometimes begrudgingly, you know, because 11 year olds have other things they want to do than to be with dad in the workshop while we're taking apart a horse mower or whatever. But but sometimes they have a lot of fun and, and you know, there we go. But, but yeah, no, they, they're they're a part of it for sure as they're as they're able. Right. You know, 11, um, six and then my daughter is three. You know, there's the three year old doesn't get to drive the hay truck, even though she thinks that she can. Um, you know, she doesn't get to doesn't get to do that just yet. Yeah. Well, I, that's, that's great. I hope that they, that they are able to carry on, uh, these traditions. Um, so the, the last question that I want to ask you before I turn it over for any audience questions is, um, how, how do you, how would you frame, um, your feelings or I don't know, how would you frame your feelings about it? finding a sense of place in the Ozarks. That's a great question. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's the only place I've ever known. Um, you know, even, you know, six generations of my kin are buried in the Arkansas Hill Country. And so it's sort of like built into the DNA of who I am, you know, at a very kind of molecular level. But like everybody, you also have to, like, it's not just enough to be like, well, I got six generations of people. Like you, you have to make a decision to be from a place, right? Um, and, and like a lot of people, um, you know, I went through a period where I wasn't sure I wanted to be from here. You know, you know, I would go somewhere and do something and, and hear all the fun jokes about being from Arkansas or being from the Ozarks and, you know, do you have inbred cousins and do you wear shoes? And man, they sure are racist in Arkansas. You know, all these different things and um it, it, sometimes it, it can wear a body out but um yeah you know we gary snyder once said that you just got to pick a place and stay there and uh um and i think we just decided you know for a lot of lots of different reasons that we just this is the place you know this once it's just where we're from our kin's here and um it's important to us that our children come up here and while we would love for them to stay here, you know, um, I also don't want them to, they have to make that decision on their own. So I think, I think those are sort of special place to me. And I, and I, you know, in my work, you know, as a farmer, my work as an advocate, you know, to protect rural ground, um, you know, I'll fight for it all day long, but I think, um, uh, it all comes back from having not for having chosen it, you know, like, I don't know how much choice I really had in it, you know, but like it, 
I, I, I feel like some days it chills me, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta choose it, I think, before you really can answer any other questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. The idea that you have to, to choose, you know, to want your place and choose that place to build a connection with it. So, um, I, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to, to questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, we did get one question in chat. Um, Janet Parsh, I hope I pronounced your last name right, Janet, uh, wants to know if you're making a profit by, if you're able to make a profit with your farm. Oh man, that's a $64,000 question for every farmer. Um, it, de it depends. Um, it depends on the enterprise and it depends on how much investment we do in a year um, in the farm. So last year we invested quite a lot in the farm, um, brought out a bunch of new sheep and bought some working facilities to be, so we can be safer, so we can have the kids involved more and stuff like that. Um, and so, um, so that means that, you know, like it, it's not profit doesn't, the profit didn't balance out quite like we wanted it to. Um, but most years the, you know, the farm generally will pay for itself. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then most years it'll even put a little bit back. Yeah. But we, I mean, you know, we have to keep, I keep, we keep pretty, pretty solid numbers on everything. You know, I know to the penny, you know, how much it costs me to put mineral out for, for my animals and, you know, how much it costs me to get feed and all that, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and honestly, one of the reasons why horses work for us is, because diesel is so expensive and the maintenance on my tractor is so expensive, you know, to keep it, you know, I do almost, I do most of the work myself on it. It, you know, like horses, you know, I can do, I can do the same work cheaper. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I like that, that the, the intentional slowdown, uh, the intentional yeah. drop in speed that, that working with animals requires. So um, Amanda, Phil Yaw Perez asks, how do you think the increasing development in the region will influence hill folk? Badly. Um, I mean, uh, some of y'all might, I don't I see a few names here, right? Some of y'all, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the way things are developing um, in, especially in the Western side of the Ozarks. Um, you know, it's not the same everywhere. Um, but I, there's, there's too much happening too fast with too few people asking good questions. Um, and, uh, and not all of, not all of the, uh, not all the developments are good, I think. Um, and I don't even mean just for Hill folk. I mean, they're not good for everybody. Um, I, I very much think it, it needs to, the developments have got to work for everybody in the, in the region, right? We have to, we can't just think about what's good for Elkins or what's good for, you know, Huntsville or what's good for whatever we got to ask, kind of ask a bigger question, right? If the region's going to grow, like everybody says it's going to grow, and I think that it is, and it is doing, um, then we have to ask more holistic questions about what can our space, you know, what is the carrying capacity, that biological equation, what is the carrying capacity that our space can meaningfully hold and be able to be resilient against change? Because whether we like it or not, climate change is already impacting us. Um, and the, you know, the intensification of urban development is, is further impacting us, especially, you know, out where I live, you know, when we have big rain events, you know, um, it, it's not uncommon for, for, um, you know, most, if not all of the, of the roads out where I live to get shut down by the County and you know, I'm stuck, I can't go anywhere. Um, and, and the, the reason isn't the rainfall. The reason is the amount of water leaving the urban centers and hitting, the watershed where I live and you know and then it, it so damages bridges takes out farmland um causes damage to roads you know like it, and, and and there's not sufficient reinvestment in these things to to deal with them and, and there's a whole bunch of other things that go along with it um I, I actually have a I I think I have an article or a little short piece coming out in the Democrat Gazette sometime this week kind of asking some of these questions um on this but this is this is a um and I'm working I'm working on a book about this some of this stuff right now as well but like I, I think on the whole I'm not I'm not sure that we're seeing net gains, net positive gains from a lot of this stuff. I think we could have, but it's sort of like a lot of things, just because it's happening this way doesn't mean that it was the right way or is the right way, or and, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to change it. Yeah. Um, okay, so Trenton uh, Roberts wants to ask, many of the back to the landers in other parts of the country during the 70s were forced out during the farming crisis of the 80s. 
do you yeah. have any idea if this was the case in the Ozarks? And he says he just yeah. wrote the book. Yeah, oh, well, thanks. But uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, the farm crisis in the 80s doesn't hit the Ozarks as hard as it does everywhere else. Um, in part because um, the Ozarks weren't as highly leveraged in debt um, as, as some of the big farm country was. So you, you got to remember um, the average size of the Ozark, of Ozark farms, even today, is still only like 245 acres, right? Um, and so you compare that to Iowa or even like East Arkansas. So like rice country, soy country is a very small farm, you know, and that's, that's today's number in 1950, the average size of the Ar of an Ozark farm was like 130 acres. Um, so our farms are a lot smaller. Um, and the, and the other thing, you know, the thing I talk about a little bit in the book, but you know, we didn't talk about today was that as Ozarks, as the Ozarks population is changing, one of the, there's two agricultural innovations that occur here. Um, one is chickens and the other is cattle. Um, and chickens and cattle um, will reshape the agricultural makeover or makeup of the of the Ozarks um, and will provide um, uh, insulation is not the right word because it's not like they're an insulated market because because they're not but um, but it 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 serves as a it serves as a little bit of a spacer I guess like a, a little maybe, I guess maybe we'll stick with insulation it's not a good word for this and I don't like it we're going to use it anyways um, it serves as the insulation from some of those larger market forces um, and, and I actually asked this question of a of a friend of mine uh, a couple of years back who's I mean, his his family they're a century farm out here in the western side of Washington County um, and you know he was he was full out farming full you know full time when the when the farm crisis hit. Um, and he said, you know, he told me, he said, well, for the most part, if you weren't highly indebted and most, most farmers at that point weren't highly indebted in the Ozarks, then it didn't hurt you too, too bad. And you may have had some tight years, but it didn't tank everybody. Right. Um, now if you're elsewhere, that, that's going to be different. And so, you know, I would, I would have to just kind of defer to those regional experts on that. If anybody's interested, one of the most the most recent issue of uh, Agricultural History Society's journal has a whole big their whole thing is on uh, is on the '80s farm crisis, um, and and kind of asking this is historians have not really done a lot with the '80s farm crisis. Historians don't like to do stuff that's too new. I got made fun of all the time when I wrote this book because I was I'm a historian, but I was working on something where everybody was still alive, and so like that's not real history. Everybody's still alive. Um, and so uh, they're just now starting to ask some of these questions um, about the farm crisis. And so, well, I imagine uh, there's a good chance that what I just told you could be proven wrong in a year or two as we start to see really a lot more, a lot more research come out. Um, so, but, but, but from what I've been able to gather, it, it seems informally, it seems like it, it wasn't a, a huge crisis here. I don't know about East Arkansas. It may, may have been terrible in rice country. You know, you'd have to ask folks from Stuttgart or something, but. So um, Janet Parsh asks, what extent, to what extent were the gay and lesbian uh, communes in the Ozarks connected with the Back to the Land movement? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I don't do a ton of writing on the LGBTQ community in the Ozarks at the time. Um, not because there weren't a lot of folks here, there were, um, but I'm a straight white guy. Um, and um, I... I got some stories from a few people, but I just never felt comfortable like taking on the telling of that story. Um, I think it it's a story that absolutely deserves to be told. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you what I do know, but with the caveat that um, it, I know only bits and pieces. Um, so one of the things I do know is that the Ozarks, because of the, the unique nature of the Ozarks, um, we're traditionally a, sort of a, a live and let live kind of place with obvious exceptions, you know, that we can all we can all think about. Um, this does become a bit of a safe haven for some communities. Um, and so we do have some notable groups emerge. So there'll be um, uh, one that comes to mind would be the Yellowhammer uh, commune, um, which was an all women's community um, that was established um, uh, and helped pave the way for a bunch of different um, uh, um, LGBT rights activities in the region. Um, uh, for, you know, from, from the seventies all the way to, 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 to now, um, they're, um, they also are going to play a role and they're going to do some really cool stuff. They're going to help develop a, um, an all women's trucking cooperative, doing all kinds of stuff like running dairy milk trucks and like semi trucks across country and 
all kinds of stuff. I mean, um, they'll help to, uh, they'll help kind of, they'll help keep ONF going for a while. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a thriving and vibrant community and story. Um, but it's one that, that it needs its own full kind of treatment. And I think it probably best deserve, deserves to be told in full by somebody that can really kind of give, understand the nuances that that story needs. Um, so one one place that that you could look for more specific answers is in an upcoming book from our University of Arkansas Press titled Aguila, uh, the vision, life, death and rebirth of a two spirit shaman in the Ozark Mountains. And it's about Maria yes. Christina Morales. Um, and actually, I last year I, I did an interview similar to this one with with Maria Christina and Laurie Umansky, who who interviewed her for that memoir. Um, and she she worked closely with a um, a lesbian commune in near Fayetteville um, and then founded her own um, back to the land community called Sant Santuario Arco Iris. I, I butcher the pronunciation of Spanish, so I just apologize to anyone who actually can can speak it. Um, but but she she's a really important character in uh, in that equation yeah um, and if, if any of y'all are around Fable and you know um, who Diana Rivers is Diana Rivers is another one of these like anchors for the community just like in general um but I mean like just like it's such a beautiful spirit and beautiful human um, but she was one of these you know she's one of these people you know I'll be reading national you know like magazines about about um women's land movements and Diana's like writing in like hey we've got land here and those are you know she's like spearheading all this different stuff and so there's there's like yeah just a powerful just a powerful history here yeah um so I think unless somebody puts in another question um Lisa Child to ask what's what's next on your list to write about and that'd probably be a, a great last question yeah, so I'm working right now on. Um, it's not really an academic book. It's, more, it's it is asking it sort of like what's like what's happening to this place like that has been my home, uh, been my family's home for so long. Um, is becoming the home for so many new people. Um, and and um, like what what's sort of the fate of the Ozarks? Um, you know, like what are we losing? What should be lost? Because there's some stuff that just should like we should just kind of ignore it. Like like not ignore it, but like no longer like valorize it. Um, but uh, kind of asking like what what's being lost, especially in rural spaces. So I'm working on that book right now. Um, and then um, I'm working on I'm beginning uh, an academic work on um, kind of looking at the development of the Ozarks through um, several of its rivers. So looking at um, the Buffalo River uh, and the White River and the Mulberry River and the Kings River in Illinois. Sort of asking using each river as a way to ask a question, ask a different question about the history of this place since the 1950s onward. And so, and that'll be like Kit Billy's little, little anchor with a lot of oral histories. Um, I think it's fun. Um, and uh, and I'm in no hurry on either one of them. Um, and so there, there's, I got kids and and uh, we got, you know, I like to see my wife and uh, we got the farm. So I'm not a huge hurry, but yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing and for talking with me today. I, I really enjoyed this conversation, um, learned a lot. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate you coming on. AFTA, I appreciate you being here. Just thank you so, so much. Oh, yeah, no problem. This was a lot of fun. Thank you all for, thank everybody for coming and thanks for having me. Yes, thank you everybody for attending and we hope to see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.